Ladies and gentlemen, we're about to begin. And here we go. Are we good to go, guys? All right. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Global Breakthrough Energy Movement Conference 2016. This is the first day, and <clears throat> we are going to be starting our afternoon session. Leading us off today is going to be Ken Rolla. Ken's a personal friend of mine. We met several years back at some of the Ormus Alchemy Conferences. He works with the Ormus and etheric elements and combining them to create organite and work with the subtle energies for healing, health, technologies, growing plants, and a bunch of other subtle energies and dynamic processes that he's going to be presenting on today. So I'd like you to give a warm welcome to Ken Rolla. Hey, everybody. You ready to party? You ready to party? All right, let's ditch this joint and go then. <laughs> no, I tell you, I, I appreciate everything the Global BEM folks have done. They, they always attract the best speakers, and that's why I come. Uh, so anyway, really, truly, you know, it's like uh, when they ask me, I just say, yeah, absolutely, because I know they're going to have an amazing lineup of people. So anyway, yes, my name is Ken Rolla. I'm from the Daytona Beach, Florida area. And if you guys want to know more about me, you can check out my, my website and my bio at freshandalive.com. So let me get this thing started here. Okay, there I am. So I'm going to be talking about new frontiers and healing with Ormus and scalar energy. And... Uh, I'm going to be going fast because I like to throw a lot of information that you guys can actually use. I'm very solutions oriented and so uh, you probably will have a hard time keeping up with me if you're taking notes, so don't worry. You can go to my website and download these slides at downloads.freshandalive.com. Now, first of all, disclaimer. Anything that I talk about in this presentation, please don't construe this as any kind of medical or health advice. This is just me sharing my ideas and opinions with you. The FDA wouldn't like it very much if you actually used any of this stuff, so please don't. Please always do what the FDA says and make sure that you always use a licensed healthcare practitioner when dealing with your health. So, and really, don't take my advice. I'm telling you right now, don't take my advice. <laughs> All right, so what is Ormus? <clears throat> uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with this, uh, it seems like a lot of people are, have heard the term and they're kind of familiar with it, but it's kind of like this nebulous thing and it sounds magical, some of the things that people say about it. But basically, Ormus elements are a... They're actually very ancient. They're not newly discovered. I'd say they're newly discovered in the United States and in, in modern science, maybe in the cutting edge of science. But basically, they're, they're, they're simply certain minerals that exist on the periodic chart, the platinum group metals, gold, silver, mercury, um, copper, that can exist as individual atoms rather than atoms connected together. Now, that sounds very simple, but that has a lot of very profound implications. Normally, all these elements are metals, and as metals, they are crystalline, which means that their atoms are attached to each other in some kind of three-dimensional grid pattern. And that's what makes them metallic looking, that's what gives them their hardness and their structure. Well, you can send them through certain processes and actually break them apart into individual atoms, which according to conventional physics is impossible. And yet, it, it happens. And you can do this yourself. And when you do this, these atoms become a completely different form. They look like white ceramic powders, as you can see here in this picture. Uh, all these different metals, whether it's copper, silver, gold, mercury, or whatever, they all become white ceramic powders when they're in this state. They have really weird physics. They're superconductors. But what makes them really weird is that they're actually interdimensional or multidimensional matter. They're not conventional matter the way we think of it. Part of the matter is this three-dimensional mineral that we see in our 3D reality, but the majority of it is actually existing simultaneously in other frequencies or dimensions of time and space. And so this gives them very special properties. They're really weird. They connect different frequencies or dimensions of time, space-time to our 3D reality, and therefore we can use them in some very interesting ways. Now, 
you would think, you know, that ingesting mercury, for example, we know ingesting mercury is very, very toxic, but in these monoatomic forms, these elements become extremely rejuvenative and regenerative to living organisms. So you can make them in certain ways, particularly in natural ways, and they can have extremely powerful healing effects and regenerative effects. And as more and more healers and supplement companies and, and inventors are figuring this stuff out, they're coming out with more and more supplements and technologies that utilize warmest elements in them. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Now, let's see here. Let me find my little remote. There we go. So... There are a lot of really interesting applications with these Ormus elements from space and time travel because they're interdimensional. Uh, I have met scientists who actually worked on f projects making anti-gravity time traveling flying saucers where they would coat the surfaces of a saucer and use a device like a Searle effect generator type device uh, to create a singularity or a black hole and enlarge it up around the, the uh, spacecraft and actually be able to blink a spacecraft out of our 3D reality and have it show up somewhere else in time and space. So <clears throat> that's one application. There are applications I'm going to be showing you today in agriculture. Uh, I don't think any of you guys probably are working on an anti-gravity flying saucer right now, so I'm not going to bother getting into that. But we will get into applications for healing and agriculture. Um, and materials engineering, there are some really interesting uses in that as well. So. How is this stuff, where does this stuff come from, first of all, and how is it created? Well, in nature, it's all ab uh, around. It's very abundant in nature, especially here in Texas. Uh, there's a lot of these monoatomic elements, these Ormus elements, in soil. And by the way, I forgot to mention that, let me back up a little bit. The Ormus, Ormes or Ormus, is simply an acronym for Orbitally Rearranged Monoatomic Elements. So that's just a fancy acronym that a man named David Hudson came up with to describe these very interesting elements. So they can be created alchemically, and this is what David Hudson and others uh, have been teaching. And as a matter of fact, our good buddy uh, Vernon Roth here today has some amazing uh, Ormus products, and I don't know if I would classify them as alchemical. I, I think they are, really. But he has a very, very unique process for making his, and his are some of the very, very few that I actually like to use and recommend. But at any rate, you can make them alchemically using processes with, for example, mixing um, sea salt with lye and water and sending it through certain processes and extracting out a precipitate, which you can then, some people will ingest it. Um, I feed it to plants or microbes. I don't ingest it directly. And usually I don't recommend that because most of the ones that I've come across are toxic, either with heavy metals or they also have some negative side effects because when you ingest these things, because they're superconducting, they'll actually plug into the body and raise the superconductivity in the body artificially, and then you wind up manifesting things you didn't intend. And we're going to talk about how that happens. But at any rate, most alchemical Ormus products, I don't recommend people ingesting them, but they're great uh, usually to feed to plants and uh, ferments. They're also made by microbial action in the soil. Obviously, plants can't suck boulders up through their roots, so they like to eat little tiny particles of minerals called angstrom particles, which are just a few atoms of a mineral bundled into a particle, or individual atoms, which are the monoatomics. And there are things that you can do to feed the soil to increase the level of monoatomics in your soil, and when you do that, you get... <laughs> insane growth. Like here in, in Texas, I know of a company, which unfortunately I can't name because they've had attempts on their life actually, that developed a product for agriculture that you can put on the soil and it will break the minerals down into monoatomic and angstrom particles extremely well. And they did field trials in Texas where you've got a lot of these minerals in the soil, but they're not very bioavailable. And they, they did a field trial at a a tomato farm, they were getting tomato plants 15 feet tall with three to 4,000 nutrient-dense tomatoes per vine. And not some kind of crazy chemical abomination, but like a real, real healthy, strong uh, tomato plant, nutrient-dense. Uh, there are also, when you feed these Ormus elements to uh, GMO crops, it will actually unwind their DNA and revert them back to heirlooms, which we're going to talk a little bit more about. So there's some really useful things you can do if you know about Ormus, and it's really easy to make. So microbe action in soil is one way. You can feed microbes to the soil to increase that. You can also use volcanic rock powders, which we'll talk about more. 
You can make these ormus elements by vortexing mineral water in magnetic fields. And there's actually uh, either ways of building your own device with a blender or you can buy a device to do that. Uh, photosynthesis is one of nature's greatest ways at making these ormus elements. So if you feed certain types of minerals to plants, they will uptake them and they will create ormus elements. That's one of my favorite ways of getting it, by the way. I grow a lot of my own food and uh, it's a great way to get these ormus elements that are in a format that the body understands and, and can utilize. And then fermentation, especially in magnetic fields. Um, Microbes are nature's nanotech. They like to eat big things and break them down into little things or eat toxic things and break them down into non-toxic things. And so you can actually make kraut in your kitchen or beer or wine or medicines uh, using different ferments. And you can throw rock powders, you can throw herbs into them, you can throw all kinds of things that are high in these ormus elements, but they're not very bioavailable. You can ferment them, and that will break them down and make them become bioavailable. And if you put these ferments inside of a magnetic field while you're doing that, which is actually really simple to do, then you can get incredible amounts of this stuff and have really amazing effects. And another source of these minerals is in volcanoes. So if you guys have ever seen the, uh, you probably heard about that pesky volcano in Iceland a few years ago that was blowing ash all over Europe and everybody was ticked off because it was interfering with the plane, the airplane uh, flight lanes and stuff. Well, that's actually a really wonderful event for the Earth because it remineralizes the Earth, especially with these ormus elements, these monoatomics. Um, but that volcano, you can actually go to YouTube and you can search on Iceland Volcano Lightning and you can see video of this volcano as it's blowing and you'll see lightning shooting up out of the volcano into the sky. And the reason that is, is because these, one of the properties of these superconducting minerals, these ormus elements, is that they're, because they're superconductors, they create superconducting fields, which are known as Meissner fields, and they can generate huge amounts of energy that want to ground out. And that's exactly what goes on when these, these volcanoes are blowing. They're creating all this ash, all this um, highly monoatomic ash, and it's creating these Meissner fields that discharge, and you see all this lightning. And of course, conventional scientists are baffled. They don't understand it because they don't know about monoatomics. But that's one of the things, you, one of the evidences you can see of the superconductivity with these uh, volcanic minerals. And the cool thing is, you can take these minerals and do things with them to get Ormus into your own self. Oops. I don't know what happened there. Did I hit the wrong button? There we go. Okay. Okay, so that's a little bit about Ormus. Now, what is scalar energy? Now, I don't really like the name scalar energy <clears throat> because it's kind of confusing. If you come from a science background in particular, there's scalar physics and there's scalar mathematics, and it really has nothing to do with what people are referring to of this subtle energy known as scalar energy. But Dr. Konstantin Meil from Germany has kind of popularized that phrase in certain circles, and so I kind of got hooked on it back in the day when I was listening to him. And so I'll, I'll for, for argument purposes, we'll just call it scalar energy. But it's just a, a subtle energy that's superluminal, meaning that it travels faster than light. And it actually is light, but it travels faster than what we've been told is the speed of light. As it turns out, the speed of light is not fixed, and it's not necessarily 186,000 miles per second either. Uh, the speed of light can change, and this particular energy is photonic light energy, but it travels far beyond what we've been told is the speed of light. And it's actually kind of like the force in Star Wars. It's really what everything in our 3D and non-physical universe is made of. It's this energy that I liken to God consciousness, and it flows through the universe, and it slows down, and it coagulates into this 3D reality, this physical reality of ours. And so... Um, Scientists now are seeing evidence of this. You can actually see this in mainstream physics journals uh, where they're discovering that this superluminal light is flooding out of the centers of galaxies. This is actually an article from phys.org, which is a very mainstream physics journal uh, where they talk about these furious black hole winds of superluminal light. So this energy comes out of the centers of galaxies and it's zipping out, and as it comes out, it's spiraling. It likes to spiral. It always spirals. And 
it's branching as it goes. So it's spiraling and it's branching as it goes. It comes zooming out of the centers of galaxies and it follows this toroidal flow around the galaxy, which we'll show a picture of. This is another uh, physics journal. <coughs> Uh, NASA Science News, there are plenty of black holes that gobble energy. Now scientists or astronomers spotted one in a distant galaxy that's giving some of its energy back. Um, and actually what's going on is these, these so-called black holes, they're actually a toroidal field. They're a donut-shaped energetic structure where energy is coming out one center of the donut and whipping around, spiraling around the donut and going back in the other side. Scientists call them black holes and white holes, but what they really are is a singularity at the center of a toroidal field. So the whole universe, as Nassim Harriman and others are pointing out, is a web of these black holes, these singularities. And these singularities are found at the centers of galaxies. They're found at the centers of suns, the centers of planets, um, the centers of any spinning bodies. Um, Nassim is also saying now that protons uh, are singularities. The whole universe is a web of these singularities. Human beings ha have a web of these singularities, these black holes within our bodies that correspond to what have been called the acupuncture meridians and the chakras. Uh, we'll get a little bit more into that here in a moment. But so this, this flow of energy is coming from the centers of galaxies, flowing outward, and it's relayed from sun to sun to sun outward to us. So ultimately it comes down to us from our sun and up from the center of the earth because planets have these singularities at their center, these interdimensional portals for this energy. And so it's coming up from the, from the center of the earth down from the sun and that's why we have these practices like Qigong and Tai Chi and Ayurveda and different practices, Kundalini Yoga, where you're taking energy in from above and down from below and bringing it in and manipulating it with your mind within the body. What you're actually doing is taking this energy that creates and can alter matter and you're using it to do exactly that, uh, usually for improving healing and for consciousness and expanding awareness. And with amazing effect, by the way. I mean, there are people who cure incurable diseases all the time simply with meditation or yoga and things like that. So as I mentioned, <clears throat> these galaxies have these toroidal shaped fields with this energy zipping around, spiraling around. And so do solar systems, so do suns, so do planets, so do human beings, so do cells, so do molecules, so do atoms, and on and on, and phenomena. From the microscopic to the macroscopic, we've got this web of these black holes, and each of them have these toroidal fields around them, and you can do things with them. As I mentioned, the chakras in the body, what they really are is large deposits of these ormus minerals along the spine. And because these ormus minerals are superconducting, they open up a place for the singularities to occur. So throughout the body, the acupuncture meridians, the DNA is loaded up with these ormus elements, the brain neural pathways are loaded up with them, the spine has these large nodes of them, and that correlates to the chakras along the spine. Now the brain is actually a scalar wave transceiver. It picks up this God consciousness flowing through the cosmos and rebroadcasts it outward and creates this local toroidal field around you. And this is how we create our reality. It's not some metaphysical meta metaphor. We actually put out this field. We grab this energy or we're conduits of this energy. And we put out this field, and this is how, because this energy can be converted into matter and other types of energy that we can see and measure, this is how we create our reality. So if you understand that, this is one of the biggest secrets that the powers that be on this planet do not want us to understand. They don't want us to understand our own power, our ability to create our reality and our ability to alter matter and alter reality, especially within our own bodies. Now, as I mentioned, the DNA is loaded with these ormus elements and it gives the DNA superconducting properties. And so... This is how consciousness meets the physical body. When you hear doctors talk about the mind-body connection, well, if there really is a mind-body connection, then it has to be, there has to be a mechanism for it. And that mechanism is in the DNA. Uh, the DNA is a superconducting antenna, and it is the interface, or one of the interfaces, I should say, for consciousness and the physical body. Now, crystals also contain these monoatomic ormus elements in them. They're hiding within, and again, you have to understand that when you analyze elements 
to see if you can find these, these ormus elements in them. In conventional analysis techniques, uh, they don't show up because they're this metamatter and they actually collapse into other forms. They collapse into other elements. So in analysis like spectroscopy, for example, which is kind of like the acid test to determine what something's made of, these ormus elements don't show up because they collapse into other elements. And so they don't show up as monoatomic gold or whatever. But they're hiding within crystals and this is what gives crystals the piezoelectric effect. For you geeks out there, you physics or engineering geeks, the piezoelectric effect is simply the ability for a crystal to emit electricity. You know, when you have a gas grill, for example, and you've got the little red button and you push it, the, the button on the gas grill to ignite the grill, what it's doing is smacking a little piece of quartz crystal that's connected to two wires. And it shoots out electricity and makes it spark and fire your grill up. So that's the piezoelectric effect. Well, it turns out <clears throat> if you squeeze on a crystal instead of smacking it, it will put out scalar waves, and you can do some very interesting things with it. Now, the ancients observed this. This is nothing new to humanity. The ancients have known about this for, you know, as long as we've been around, and they observed it in nature. Uh, they observed it, for example, in eggs. The egg form is very, very conducive to the living organism, the growing living organism inside of it, and it's because the shape combined with the fact that this bone, this calcium that an egg is made of, is high in monoatomic elements. So what you've got is a superconducting antenna that directs this God consciousness flowing through the cosmos in concentrated doses into the inside of that egg form. So the ancients noticed this, and they started building um, devices and things to mimic that. And that's why you see the Greek amphoras, for example, that have this egg shape for storing food and water. Or kimchi pots, for example. Kimchi pots and the old amphoras, they were made out of high ormus soil. Soil that's high in these volcanic minerals in this egg form that concentrates, just like an egg, it concentrates life force inside the vessel. Then the, in the case of kimchi, they always, the traditional kimchi pots are always made out of specific clay and they bury it in the ground for several months. It goes through several different astrological cycles. The, a lot of this knowledge has been lost in modern times, but the ancients knew to put this stuff in the ground at certain times when the moon and the sun were in certain positions, to leave it in the ground for a certain period of time before pulling it out. And then what happens is you get much higher levels of nutrients and much more digestible food. Well, Rudolf Steiner noted this as well, and he developed a method that's now used in biodynamic farming where, for example, and I, when I was first introduced to this years ago, I was, you know, out of engineering school, but I wasn't aware of any of this stuff. I thought it was absolute nonsense. Uh, some guy showed me, he took a five-gallon bucket of water, he put some cow poop in it from a cow horn, stirred it up with his hand, and stirred it and vortexed it in one direction for a while, and then he would reverse and vortex it in the other direction. He said, now if you put this on your crops, it'll make them grow better. And I thought he was totally insane. <clears throat> but it turns out he was correct, because I didn't understand the very advanced physics involved in it. But Rudolf Steiner figured out that with chemical farming, this was back in the early 1900s, even then, it was obvious to him that chemical farming was going to destroy so much soil that we wouldn't have enough compost to go around to heal it all back and bring it back. So he developed these homeopathic methods for healing soil by taking cow poop and stuffing it in a cow horn and burying it underground for a full year. And then you dig it out and you take it and you put it into water and you vortex the water for a certain period of time in one direction and the other direction. And then you take that and dilute it and you spray it on large amounts of land. And it will radically improve the land because it accelerates microbe growth in the soil, which breaks down toxins, which improves nutrient levels, et cetera, et cetera. And so it really does work. And um, so when you understand the physics, this makes a lot more sense. This is actually a picture of a traditional preparation of, of what they call Steiner preps, where you take these cow horns, and again, these horns are Fibonacci curved, they're sacred geometrically curved horns made out of high ormus material. So you've got a superconducting cone in a Fibonacci curve that focuses energy into the inside of the horn, which by the way, the reason horns are shaped the way they are and animals have them is because it's an antenna for them. That's why deer and horned animals are so sensitive to what's around them. 
They have to be. They have to know what predators are going to be around them. So you've got this superconducting antenna that's directing all this energy, this life force energy, into the inside of it. You stuff it full of cow poop, which is a probiotic mineral supplement, basically. You let it sit for a year. The Earth goes through the full astrological or astronomical cycle and all these different energies. One of the things I didn't mention is that these Ormus elements, because they're superconductors, they're extremely sensitive to fields. So they can pick up the, the electromagnetic and scalar energies coming from many, many, many light years away in our cosmos. So when they're in the ground, they act like antennas in the ground and they capture this cosmic energy and bring it into the soil and create fields within the soil that are very, very beneficial to living organisms, including microbes and earthworms and, and plants. So when you put them in these horns, You've got this perfect curve. The microbes eat up the cow poop, and what you're left with is a high ormus mineral, very, very dense ormus mineral supplement, which you can then put into water. And then when you vortex it, especially if you vortex it in a magnetic field, you'll make the ormus even more bioavailable. And then when you feed it to crops and soil, it makes the microbes happy. They grow bigger. They eat more rocks, break them down into more bioavailable particle sizes, and the plants can uptake them, and then they're much healthier. Now, the ancients, again, they observed this. They, they were very observant of what was going on in nature. They were probably having help from extraterrestrials as well. And they noticed that volcanic mountains put off these vortexes. There are stories of shamans and medicine people who could feel the energies in different power spots, and they could identify them. They would mark them. And, uh, of course, archaeologists and in, in Paleontologists find these stones marked in certain ways and they don't have an explanation for why they were marked, but they marked stones and they marked places that were high in these superconducting elements that put off these scattered fields and vortexes. So this is a picture of Mount Shasta in California and I had a friend who gave me this picture and she said, oh my God, there's UFOs over Mount Shasta. <clears throat> And I say, well, there may be UFOs over Mount Shasta, but that's not why those clouds are shaped that way. That's the skater wave vortexes coming off of the mountain that's spin spiraling upward like an upside-down tornado of energy, and it's slicing up the clouds into those shapes. And that's exactly what's going on. You've got this singularity at the center of the Earth that's emanating all this skater energy, and it's in a geometric pattern. This, this singularity at the center of the Earth is shaped like a crystal. It's like a very complex cubic octahedron, for those of you that are following Nassim Harriman. And these, these vortices of energy come out of the apexes of that geometry and shoot out to the surface of the Earth. These volcanic mountains capture it. They're like the chakras of the Earth. They capture it, and then they spin these vortexes up out through them. And the types of minerals that they're made of are oscillators. Crystals are all oscillators. So you put energy in in one frequency, it comes out the other side a different frequency. So these mountains are oscillators. They put out certain frequencies that are harmonious to living organisms. And then the rotation of the earth combined with the gravitational field drags them down across the surface of the earth. So you've got these spiraling vortexes going along the surface of the earth. And that is what people call the ley lines. So if you're living in proximity to a ley line or one of these mountains, you're, you're, you're going to see the animals and the plants grow healthier, and therefore, normally, the people are going to be healthier as well. And again, the ancients noticed this, so they started mimicking it by making their own artificial mountains. And that's exactly what pyramids are. Pyramids are skater wave antennas. They're transceivers. They pick up this energy coming from the sun and from the center of the earth, and they rebroadcast it outward in a toroidal field around them, and then they create a vortex of skater waves that go up out of the tip. And you can, it has all kinds of very beneficial uses that way. Uh, this is actually a Curlian photograph of the energy coming off the tip of a, a pyramid, and you can see it's a double helix. wonder why our DNA is shaped the way it is. Hmm. You see evidence of this everywhere you go, uh, this manifestation of this spiraling, vortexing energy coagulating, slowing down and coagulating into our 3D reality. Uh, out here in the lobby, there's actually a picture, it's actually a kind of a picture sculpture of the Colorado River here in Texas and all the tributaries. And if you look at it, it's winding back and forth. It's horseshoeing back and forth, almost bending back onto itself. And the reason is, is because that water wants to flow in a vortex. It, it, it's following the natural 
flow or the motion of the planets and the solar system and the entire galaxy. The entire galaxy is in motion. Nothing's sitting still. You know, our sun isn't like sitting out here in space doing nothing and all the planets are rotating around it. That's not how it is. The sun is spiraling around through the galaxy and we're spiraling around it. And so that spiraling motion makes the energy and water want to spiral. So because that water is nailed to the ground by gravitation, instead of spiraling, it just wiggles back and forth in these... In these um, Horseshoe patterns. So, that's all fine and dandy. That's warmest, that's skater energy. So what? What can you do with it, right? It's like, well, this is nice. I'm going to go home and kick the dog and drink a beer, right? Well, there's a lot of cool things you can do with this, but if you don't understand these fundamentals, it'll be like it was for me 30 years ago, thinking this is all a bunch of New Age nonsense. One of the applications that I'm a real big fan of is a quantum biofeedback device, as they're known, called the QXCI SKIO, or its newer cousin, the Inigo. And this device, um, basically it's a combination of computer software and an interface and some straps that you hook up to your ankles and your wrists and your forehead. And it can actually read the scalar energetic signature of the matter in your body and compare it with a database of known values that it has, and then it can tell what's going on within your body. Now, you have to understand that all the elements on the periodic chart, uh, and this is conventional physics, this is even anything extravagant, it's known that every element has, at its, in its subatomic structure, it vibrates. And each element vibrates at a different frequency. So, for example, hydrogen vibrates at a certain frequency. Oxygen vibrates at a certain frequency. If you combine two hydrogens and an oxygen atom together, it's going to have an overall frequency, and you can measure that and understand that's water. And so this is how the skia works. It basically looks at different levels of granularity within the body at the scalar vibrational frequencies of things, and it can identify if you've got heavy metals or toxins or parasites or pathogens or emotional issues with your parents or whatever. It's crazy what this thing can read. It can even detect ghosts in the room, believe it or not. And it's because emotions, human emotion and consciousness is a form of scalar energy. It's really just God consciousness. It's kind of localized. It's flowing through everything. We capture it, we use it, and we create our own little reality with it. But this is how this device is able to do some amazing things. Um, it's not FDA approved as a diagnostic device, but I do use it an awful lot for screening. Uh, you can do things, for example, like test supplements, and you can actually um, use it to figure out what dosages of specific supplements are right for you or if the supplement's not right for you. Uh, so I do that a lot when I'm doing testing of supplements. Um, other things you can do with this energy. I actually make devices that utilize this energy for different purposes. Years ago, um, when I was making fer ferment and fermented foods, and I also would make these fermented brews using uh, a product called Effective Microorganisms. And... Um, I started realizing, like, wow, you know, I can do all these other things that haven't been done with fermentation. And one of them is putting the ferment in a skater energy field. <clears throat> so I started learning about organite. And uh, organite is a material, basically, that has some kind of non-conducting resin or substrate, like fiberglass resin or plastic or glass or something. And it has crystals in it. It has metal particles in it. And... There are several different effects that occur with that. Um, basically, crystals themselves, as I mentioned, because they have these monoatomics in them, they put out, they are automatically, they put out scalar waves all the time. They're like antennas for it. And if you squeeze on them, they'll put out even more because of the piezoelectric effect. Uh, but then also, there's something called the Casimir effect. And when you put two plates of metal very close together, like a sixteenth of an inch apart from each other, they'll generate a charge, but they'll also generate scalar waves. And the people that are making organite, even Carl Hans Wells, who invented organite, um, and Wilhelm Reich, who really is the probably the modern inventor of this technology, they didn't understand the physics of this. That they just were kind of mimicking what they observed. Um, but the, the Casimir effect will create scalar waves. So when you put particles close together, you're going to get surface area close enough together that you're going to get some of the Casimir effect. So the finer the particles, the more the Casimir effect you're going to, you're going to get. So I started making these disks to put off scalar fields, and then I would put fermentation buckets on them, and it would radically increase the nutrient levels 
and the ferment time. It would speed up the ferment time quite a bit. So I developed a large disc and I put it under five gallon buckets to do this. Well, people started wanting to buy them and so I started selling them to people and then they started using them for all kinds of crazy stuff I never imagined. They were sleeping with them and putting them in their refrigerators and growing plants with them and all kinds of crazy stuff. So I figured out that there's a lot, hey, there's a lot of other things we can do with this. Um, and so now I make these discs and I sell them. And I was already making a powered, little powered skater wave device that you can carry with you for protection against jet lag and EMF, and it would also help you get into deep sleep states. And so I started applying all these different things I was learning from making these discs and other things I was learning about, and developed a pyramid that's a powered skater wave generator that will put out a field and skater waves, and it'll help you get into deep sleep, and it'll protect against EMF and do all kinds of strange things. Um, and other people have been doing this as well. There are people making organite cones and pyramids, and you can actually take little small pyramids or cones, just like six inches tall, stick them outdoors, and they will actually clear chemtrails out of the sky, and they'll balance the weather if you build them right. You don't have to build a gigantic pyramid. You can just make these little tiny pyramids. Actually, here in the Bastrop area, there's a guy named... Um, um, Dowen Gardner, uh, he goes by the handle of Organite Austin because he lives in Austin. He's been making really good Organite and spreading it around and doing some really good things to protect this area. That's one of his pyramids down there in the bottom. Um, I wound up developing a device, that, a powered skateway device that will actually clear a 75 mile radius of nuclear fallout and chemtrails and balance the weather. Uh, it'll stop hurricanes, it'll stop severe weather, it'll stop droughts, it'll stop floods, it stops all that stuff. Um, and, of course, I got too public with it and started having death threats and stuff. And I had worked with Free Energy back in the early 90s, and so um, I've had friends murdered and hurt and things like that. So I know to take these threats seriously, so I, I don't, don't get too public with it anymore. Now, Dr. Alexander Golod, who is, um, has impeccable credentials, he is a... Um, works for the Russian military, uh, high level in the Russian military, and he, during when the Cold War warmed up a little bit or eased off a little bit, he started working with pyramids. Presumably the government probably wanted him to understand them for warfare purposes, but being a benevolent person, he started studying them for beneficial purposes and discovered all kinds of amazing things. They can make oil wells flow faster and flow better and produce more. Uh, they can clean up pollution in the ground and groundwater, including radioactivity. They can clean up radioactivity in the atmosphere and air pollution in the atmosphere. They can stop severe weather. Um, they can even stop earthquakes. These are people sitting inside of his large pyramid outside of Moscow, and it's made completely out of non-conducting materials. Uh, with skater waves, non-conducting, electrically non-conducting materials are best to work with for creating these kinds of structures. You can do it with metals, but you have to know what you're doing. They act more like wave guides. So anyway, these are people sitting inside and getting healed. They found that people could go inside the pyramid and get healed of major diseases. And these big domes or these big um, globes here, those are made of crystal. They discovered also you can charge crystals. You can put crystals in the pyramid, charge them up, and then they can take them out and give them to people and they will emanate this skater energy and heal people. Now, there are a lot of really cool um, benefits from his pyramids, and we'll just get into a few of them. There's so many, we really, I don't have time to list them all. But um, as I mentioned, neutralizes radioactivity in the atmosphere and in groundwater. It cleans up toxins in the air and in the groundwater. It increases yields of seeds and crops. Um, reduces seismic activity. What it does is it releases the tectonic shifts little by little every day instead of letting them build up into big shifts and that way you don't have big earthquakes. Now they noticed a lot of springs popping up all around Golod's Pyramid for miles around and it's because when you understand these Ormus elements are in soil, they're actually made by microbes eating rocks in the soil, but they're trapped in the soil so they can't levitate. They're anti-gravitational, that's one of their properties and they want to levitate up, but they can't. The soil holds them down. So what happens is rainwater will wash through the soil and wash them down into aquifers. And when they've accumulated enough, the anti-gravitational properties will levitate the water up to the surface. That's how spring water gets to the surface most of the time. It's usually not hydrostatic pressure. It's the ormus levitating up to the surface. That's how you have springs at the top of 13,000 foot high mountains. 
You know, how, how does water get up to the top of a 13,000 foot high mountain? How does, a, how does water get up to the top of a 400 foot tall tree? You know, the redwoods in California, how does that water get up there? If you know anything about physics, you can't pump water or you can't suck water up that high. Um, the trees do a combination of bubbling CO2 that they absorb in their, in their veins, in their capillaries, and bubbling the water up, but it also is the ormus elements levitating it up to the plant. Now, the cool benefit of Golod's Pyramid, and this gives me hope for humanity, is that there were some flowers they noticed growing out in the fields around his pyramid. If you recall in that picture, there were these big fields around this big pyramid. And they noticed some flowers no one had ever seen before. So they called a botanist in to have them identify. And they discovered they've been extinct on Earth for 11 million years. And so Golan theorized that these pyramids, this pyramid energy, can capture the patterns of things from other times and places and bring them into our present. And um, some people call it the Akashic Records. He calls it the quantum field, I believe. But these things can bring, if these can, things can bring extinct species back onto the planet, think about all the things we've wiped off the planet that we could bring back. Now, there are people making and selling organite all over the place. And I'll tell you the truth, most of it, probably 95% of it is not that well built. Um, some of it's just outright junk that doesn't work. But there are some people that have, you know, are making good stuff. This was a, a pyramid I saw on eBay that I thought was pretty cool, and it's bound to work quite well the way it's constructed. And this is one of those cases where you can use, they're using metals in the construction, and they know what they're doing. And this thing probably really does an amazing job of keeping chemtrails out of the sky and balancing the weather. And... Hello, what are you up to? Huh? Oh, right, right, right. Um, are you heading down my way at all? No. Um, oh, I don't want to share the phone because it's something to do with my project. Right, right. I was wanting to know if I can get a thing off you. Huh? I've no go in. You've no go anything? No, of course, I've no go in, do you know what I mean? They're saying they should have slept, you know what I mean? No, oh, but fuck me, man. No, I've, I've just had an argument and I was fucked off, man, so. Thank you. You know what I mean? Thank you. It's none of your business, man. No, no, it's none of your business, it's just fucking. I just. Fuck. Fuck it, mate, know what I mean? I'm just... What, right, mate? What's it? I can't hear you. You say Mr. Bullshit? Have I got some? Mr. Bullshit? Aye. Aye. She was... Aye. She was drunk, mate. And followed in fucking Valium. No, I did ask you, I was trying to hint, but I didn't know what to say. Oh, Emma's fucking... Know what I mean? Ah, uh, you know, but fucking... Off. I, I don't want to say too much on the phone. Do you know what I mean? Uh, 
Oh, oh, game. Fuck shit, mate. Oh. There's only way you can do anything. I'll give you 10 real value, mate, if you can, man. My head's up my ass. I mean, I may just got a bus doing it to my mum and dad's night, man. Fuck it. You know what I mean? I feel it just fucking. I, I, I've had enough, mate. I'm fucking. I'm at, I'm at the point, mate. I feel it just while on my fucking tablets, man. I'm fucking it right off. And going to my next life, mate. Do you know what I mean? Honestly, mate, it's that bad. I, that day I feel fucking. I just. I'm, I'm fucking. Oh. I know, mate, I know, but how hard do you need to try? I just... I've had enough, mate, I've had enough. I've just had enough, mate. I try to tell her something, no, I mean, fucking something happened today, man. I try to tell her and she just basically, like, didn't he give a fuck, know what I mean? I'm like, it's my fucking mum I'm talking about here. Yeah. And, 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 aye, oh, mate, so. Uh, uh, Alright mate, it will. I probably won't see you in the morning anyway mate, so... Mate... Aye, 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 It has not been possible to connect your call. Is there my name, aye? I'm at my pals, you know. Oh. She's at my house, but I'm at, I'm at my pals. Oh, right, right, all right then. Can you ask your geezer for me she, when you're back here on the road then, if that's all right? Ah, will do. Right, right, all right, 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 bye, bye. Alright, bye,
and probably other things, improving plant growth in the area. I noticed when I put my device outside in my yard, I've got about five acres. I'm in Florida where we've got a lot of molds on everything, you know, plants and all kinds of stuff. And I noticed after a few months of putting it out that the molds went away, which I found quite interesting. But at any rate, you basically at the corners of this pyramid at the bottom, you've got this little piece of organite at each corner that generates these skater waves, sends them up through the tubes because these waves are vortexing through the tubes. And then it goes up and hits the organite at the top and then it comes out and vortexes into a big, strong vortex. Now, the thing of it is, human beings can do this. Our biology can do this ourselves. You can actually do this yourself. You can go out into your yard and meditate and envision creating a vortex of energy and clearing the chemtrails or changing the weather. You can actually, I was out the other day with a gardener and we were making clouds dissolve just by directing our consciousness at it. It's because we are skater wave transceivers. We take this energy and we can broadcast it. This is why native peoples throughout the world, throughout history, have gotten together in circles and done ceremony. You know, they may not know all the physics, they just know, for example, a rain dance or a rain ceremony. You get into a circle and you generate, you get a bunch of human beings generating skater vortexes, and then that will combine to create one big vortex that goes up into the atmosphere and it acts like a vacuum cleaner. It actually changes the ionization of the atmosphere. It's like an upside down tornado of this subtle energy. And it goes up, and the, if you've got a big enough group, you create this vortex where the, the apex of it is out in space. And so it's sitting there vortexing with the big end of the vortex down toward the ground, and the point out in space acts like a vacuum cleaner, pulls the pollution out, balances the ionization atmosphere, and then you get whatever you need in terms of weather. If you need rain, if, it's been, if there's been a drought, you get rain, but you get enough, you don't get too much. If it's been flooding and raining too much or strong winds or whatever, it just goes away. And I've seen this over and over and over again. So we don't have to have these technologies outside of ourselves. They just make it more convenient because who's got the time to sit out in the yard and meditate all day? Especially with all the spraying that's going on. Now there's some really cool supplements. This is starting to get into the very cutting edge supplement companies like uh, ancient tech. You know, Vernon Ross Company, he's been doing this for eons. I mean, Vernon knew this stuff probably back in 1911 before anybody else did, because his, his Ormus products are some of the first I came across, and they're actually some of the very, very few that I like and recommend. But this one is a really interesting iodine supplement from Dr. Gabriel Cousins at the Tree of Life Rejuvenation Center in Arizona. And it is monoatomic iodine, but he didn't just stop with that. They actually use a skater device to program it with the anti-frequencies of all known radioactive elements. So this iodine, because it's superconducting, not only when you ingest it will it give you iodine and help your thyroid and help your body, but also it emanates the anti-frequencies, skater frequencies, of radiation and it will actually neutralize radioactivity in the body. Now they can't claim that, and I'm not claiming that, I'm just telling you this is what my experience has been in using this stuff. Um, scalar energy, because it creates and alters matter, it can do all kinds of interesting things and it can neutralize radioactivity. That device I told you about called the Skio and the Indigo, those devices can neutralize radioactivity in the body. And I know that firsthand because a little over a year ago, I got radiation poisoning for the first time. I've had it three times now. You know, nobody's going to, I wouldn't volunteer for radiation poisoning. So spirit kind of sends me that way and then I have to deal with it and figure it out. And then I share it with people. So I got radiation poisoning the first time and it was pretty bad. And I had to figure out really quick what to do. And fortunately, I was already doing a lot of it. I didn't even know because I was testing some new supplements, and it turns out those supplements pulled it out of my body. But in the process, I, went, I found out that the Skio and the Indigo, I actually got hooked up to one, and it, in three hours it neutralized the radioactivity in my body, which is pretty amazing. Um, and then I found out about this. Three days later, I'm talking to Gabriel Cousins, and this is kind of how my life works. I swear, I feel like Forrest Gump sometimes, because it's like when you're, you know, when you're living in line with the way nature is and works, it's a lot easier and things fall in your lap. And so I kind of have gotten accustomed to that. You know, I mean, like I said, I wouldn't go volunteer for radiation poisoning, but when that happens, it's like the answers come. And so this was one of them. Three days later, I'm talking to him on the phone. And he says, oh yeah, we've got this amazing, two amazing supplements that'll pull this stuff out of the body. This is one of them. The other one 
is a really, really cool water. It's actually an Ormus water. This is just water with monoatomic something in it. I don't know exactly because it's proprietary and they won't tell me, but it's some kind of Ormus water that has been programmed with the anti-frequencies of all known radioactive elements, and it does the same thing. You take like 12 drops a day of this stuff, and it will remove radiation from the body. It's quite amazing. And again, I know this firsthand because I used this stuff, and it worked for me, uh, and I've used it on other people and tested them. The Skio and Indigo, by the way, will test for radioactivity in the body. Although if you go to a practitioner and ask for that, I mean, you know, they're going to throw all kinds of disclaimers at you because that's not a diagnostic device. Now, our good buddy, our 10-4 good buddy, Vernon Roth, as I mentioned, he's got some really amazing products, and I was telling him a little while ago. I met Vernon in 2005 at the Ormus Conference in um, Enota, Georgia. And I was actually disappointed in the conference, and I was leaving, and I came in to say goodbye to a friend of mine, and as I'm sitting there, Vernon's up on stage talking, and as I'm, I'm talking, saying goodbye, I'm here. Which, interestingly enough, doesn't come from Jersey. It comes from Texas. I think it used to come from Jersey, but at any rate, um, you can, Jersey Green Sand is a really good one. I think it's also known as Rhyolite. Uh, Redmond Minerals, they've got minerals for livestock that you can use to feed your plants. All volcanic, very high enormous. You can also vortex these. I do all kinds of stuff with these. I don't just feed them to plants. I don't do just what they tell me to do with them. I start thinking, like, Man, what, what kind of diabolical stuff can I do with this? So you can vortex them in your vitalizer. I put azomite and all kinds of rock powders and my supplements and everything else in my blender, in my vitalizer every day. I vortex it for 27 minutes and I drink it. And that's a rush. Now, this product, Microblast, was originally developed for agriculture. <clears throat> but they had a bad experience with agriculture, so they started selling it as a parasite cleanse. Um, and it's phenomenal for that. It actually, it's really weird stuff. It's like six simple uh, herbs, like two ferns, chocolate, peppermint, a couple others. Nothing exotic. It must be real high enormous. There's some kind of process they put this through. It's really weird. It's just a soap. It tastes like that soap, you know, like in, in elementary school, that old nasty soap, you know, in the, in the bathrooms. It tastes like that smells. That old brown soap. I mean, that's, but it's amazing. You can, you know, put it in capsules and swallow it, and it will kill parasites and pathogens in the body extremely well. Uh, it actually isolates them by their protein structure and breaks just the pathogens down. It doesn't harm beneficial organisms in the body. Uh, but you can take like a tablespoon of this, put it in a gallon of water and feed your crops with it and see what happens. There's another one called BioWash that's similar, a little different, not quite the same, but it also, you can get amazing results with that on crops. Now, another cool thing you can do is you can make your own medicines and you can neutralize nuclear fallout. That's what I'm getting ready to show you. <laughs> With what? With this stuff. Um, but first, uh, that water, that Ormus water that I, you know, that I run through in a vitalizer, I got the idea to feed it to some kombucha and water kefir. And, oh my God, the water kefir grains, normally water kefir grains, the, the actual culture, they look like little jelly balls about the size of a green pea and you know you got a ton of them in a in a batch and they take about 10 days to 14 days you you mix sugar and water and these grains together and they ferment it's kind of like beer or wine but you get this fizzy soda that is a really good probiotic and normally it takes about 10 to 14 days to make it but when i took my vortex water i put some concentrated liquid sea minerals into this water vortex it for like 27 minutes, then poured it into my culture, and in like four days, it was done. But the interesting thing was the grains, which are normally the size of a pea, were like the size of a quarter. I mean, they were gigantic. So this is what happens. What these Ormus elements do is they bring energy into the process. Photosynthesis and fermentation are interdimensional processes. They're not just chemistry, and this is what most scientists don't get. It's not just chemistry. It's interdimensional physics. So, 
to neutralize radioactivity, there is a culture called Effective Microorganisms. I sell it on my website. It's like 24 bucks a quart. And here's the cool thing. You can make gallons and gallons and gallons of it yourself. All you do is take a quart of this stuff, mix it with a quart of blackstrap molasses, organic blackstrap molasses, and five gallons of water. You keep it around 95 degrees for three weeks, and in three weeks you'll have five gallons of it. Now the cool thing is it has tons and tons of different uses. You can use it as a probiotic supplement. You can actually drink this stuff, so you can guzzle all the probiotics you want all day long. And it only takes like a couple tablespoons a day, you know. I mean, it's ridiculous. So you've got like, you know, a lifetime supply in one batch. But that's just one use for it. You can also use it, of course, with animals. Uh, you can use it as a deodorizer. These microbes eat toxins and break them down into non-toxic elements. You can use it as a deodorizer, like a carpet cleaner, a deodorizer, window cleaner, counter cleaner. You can use it to um, break down compost faster, a compost accelerator. You can use it to remove odors in, in animal stalls and on farms, and it will break down their manure faster. It also disinfects. Um, you can use it to remediate polluted water. And you can use it to neutralize radioactive fallout. Now, you can get the instructions on how to make this stuff on my website at downloads.freshandalive.com. So you can get this presentation and other presentations I've done and other information and the instructions on how to make this on that downloads page. And that downloads page is not available through the menu system on the website. If you don't know that URL, you won't be able to find it. Now, this is proof that this stuff will neutralize radioactivity. There is actually this video on YouTube, and it's on uh, a special page on my website, radiationlinks.freshandalive.com. A farmer in Fukushima City, Japan. Everybody around him, their crops, their soil is all radioactive. They can't sell it. He used EM, spraying it on his soil, spraying it on his crops. Zero measurable radioactivity. Zero. And this is showing. This is showing the testing and stuff that they did. So... This is what we have the power to do. All this stuff, all the solutions to these problems that we have are inexpensive, and they're not necessarily high-tech. You know, this, this stuff's been around for eons. Consciousness can alter matter. If consciousness can alter matter, what can't we do? We've been so conditioned and programmed with this slave mentality, like, oh, woe is me. There's radioactivity. What are we going to do? I sure hope somebody saves us. Get off your butt and save yourself. That's what, you know, when I, when I heard Fukushima, when I heard the, about the Fukushima disaster, the first thing I thought was, hmm, I wonder if the United States used a skater weapon to create the earthquake. So I Googled it, and sure enough, one of the first things that came up was the Minister of Finance of Japan being interviewed by the editor of Forbes China. And the, this is the guy who reports directly to the Prime Minister of Japan saying on record, on video, that the United States had used a skater weapon not just to create the Fukushima earthquake, but two other earthquakes previous to that on the west coast of Japan in order to blackmail Japan into economic policies against China because the United States knows that China and Russia and the BRICS alliance of countries is working to create an alternative currency for world trade. That's known as the world's reserve currency. It's what countries used to do business with. Right now, the U.S. dollar is the world's reserve currency, so everybody's got to trade their assets for dollars to buy stuff. But we don't. We can just, if we want oil, we just print up monopoly money and go buy oil. So the U.S. seriously doesn't want that to end. But these countries are working to end that. So the Fukushima, according to this interview with the Minister of Finance, this was an attempt by the United States to keep the dollar from losing its reserve currency status. The first two times that the earthquakes, they were hit with earthquakes, they, they wouldn't go along with the plan. But the third time with Fukushima, they relented and went ahead. So that, you know, when you hear these kinds of things, it makes a hell of a lot more sense than the nonsense we're told through the mainstream media. Now, I use these things, as I mentioned, growing. I grow outdoors with, these, with all these. I have my skater wave devices where I'm growing food. I've got them outdoors uh, and indoors, wherever I'm growing. I've got skater wave generators. I've got Ormus elements using on all this stuff. I get crazy nutrient-dense food. I'm so used to eating this stuff. I, I hate eating out when I, you know, going anywhere else. It's like when I travel 
Food doesn't taste like food to me. It's like cardboard. When you're used to eating food that has real nutrients in it and all the chemicals in it that it's supposed to have in it and the energy, it's like, man, you get spoiled. It's like going to Whole Foods. I call it Whole Frauds because it's not really food. It's, you know, I mean, there is some. There are organic farms that are learning about this stuff, and certainly biodynamics know about this stuff. But, you know, even organic food is no assurance that you're going to get nutrient-dense food. It's not even an assurance that you're going to get stuff that's not radioactive. So you need to know about these things. But at any rate, you can grow tons of food. Even if you're in the middle of Manhattan on a high-rise, you can grow tons of food right next to a window. So that's my presentation. Thank you very much, and uh, I will see you all later. Thank you very much, Ken.